I am Sabrina Miller. Thank you for joining us this evening for a presentation on Detroit District's general permits for dredging. This is the last of our four-part series for the spring, and I would invite you to check out our webpage to see what offerings we're going to have this fall. Some of the topics we're thinking about doing presentations on are mitigation, historical resources, and jurisdiction. If you're interested or have some suggestions for presentations in the future, please let us know. So let's get into dredging in Michigan waters. The Corps has two main categories of permits, general permits and individual permits. The general permits provide authorization for certain activities that are supposed to have minimal adverse environmental effects, environmental impacts, excuse me. Individual permits, on the other hand, are required for projects that may have more than minimal adverse environmental impacts. Individual permits require a more extensive review, including public notice, coordination with other agencies, and an environmental review. Sorry for doesn't want to change. Sorry about that, folks. The advantage of the general permits is that by tailoring a project to fit the category is that they can be reviewed much more quickly. So if you decide at the last minute you need a dredging, you can actually get that turned around fairly quickly by contacting us as quickly as um, you know you need to do that project. The Corps has two broad categories of general permits. Permits issued by the Corps' headquarters covering the entire country, known as nationwide permits, and permits that meet are issued to meet specific regional concerns known as regional permits. With respect to dredging projects, the regional or nationwide permits under which a project may qualify is not only project specific, but it's also determined by the volume of material that's going to be dredged and the size of the area being dredged. All of our nationwide and regionals have similar restrictions in common. We'll talk about those a little further on. So let's take a, um, uh, let's take a look at some examples of regional permits for individual and annual dredging. So we have the basic differences between the two here on this slide. Let's again, I'd like apply those to some examples. Oops, I jumped ahead of myself. I'm sorry about that, folks. Some of the restrictions on regional dredging is, of course, no dredging of wetlands, no temporary side casting. All material must be moved to an upland site and prevented from returning to the water body or a wetland unless it's used as discharge material at a previously authorized discharge site. So we'll take a look at that restriction also a little further on. Hydraulic dredging is also not authorized unless you meet very specific conditions regarding the disposal of material directly into suitable disposable dis disposal facilities. Previously authorized nourish beach nourishment areas, or in an up, upland area, or into a commercial geotextile disposal tube. Let's get to those examples I mentioned. This is a good example of an annual dredging project. It's on Lake Superior. This large creek mouth here gets kind of shoaled in by the longshore current in this area and by storm events. So here we have a a boat ramp. It's a large parking area. This ramp is typically used by smaller uh, fishing and recreational boaters. The project has a clear defined dredging area, which is here at the mouth. And it doesn't take a huge volume of material in order to facilitate access in and out of Lake Superior. Here we have the same area after a major storm event, you can see the whole mouth has moved and there's just this little tiny discharge um, out into Lake Superior. Large amount 
amounts of material have been tossed up on the shoreline and all the way up this creek, even up here by the bridge and along here by the boat ramp. Here is an aerial photo of the dredged area somewhat recently after the dredging took place. You can see they, they took the dredge material and they put it landward of the ordinary high water mark along the beach down shore. The dredged material consisted of unpolluted sand and rock, mostly rock at this area. And as I said, it was disposed down shore, landward of the ordinary high water mark. This is an example of individual dredging. And there's a small amount of material they pulled out of the canal to serve as backfill between a previously existing seawall and the new seawall, which is no more than one foot waterward of the previous seawall. Here, we have a case where they're doing a couple of different activities. They are installing a new seawall, and when they dredge for placement of riprap waterward of the seawall, they took that dredge material and they put it landward of the seawall as backfill. So that's simultaneous with an ongoing construction. There's also two nationwide permits for dredging. The nationwide permit for minor dredging authorizes the removal of a very small volume of material, no more than 25 cubic yards, from an area no more than 1,000 square feet. This um, is primarily used, but not, I mean, it has several different applications, but it's largely used for gaining tow zone, waterward of a residential seawall, or deepening an existing mooring area next to a dock on a great lake. Maintenance dredging is limited to marinas or boat slips to previously authorized depths, not to exceed 5,000 cubic yards over a five-year period. We have a couple examples along those lines as well that we'll look at. The restrictions on nationwide are very much similar to regional permits. Neither nationwide permit, neither nationwide permit authorizes dredging in areas where there's aquatic vegetation present, in wetlands, in important fish spawning areas, or areas of concern. Fish spawning areas, um, you have to be aware of dredge windows and areas of concern, places where they believe there was previous contamination, and those, in those cases, sediment testing might be required. And if you have a very complicated project and you're following strict timelines, you really need to be aware of those um, dredge windows because of fish spawning habitat. So those are available online on the Eagle webpage. And also, another important consideration for both visual and nationwide, again, is that the dredge material must be disposed of in an upland area. We're going to talk more about that later in this presentation. For any additional in detail in the language of nationwide and regional, you can always look, check out the per specific permit language on our webpage, and you can also always give us a call if you have any questions. This is an example of a marina basin on Lake Erie. It's a good example of how we make use of the nationwide permit for, uh, for nature, excuse me, <clears throat> for maintenance dredging. You see here, this is an early spring photo, and the leaves haven't even, you know, come out yet on this, in this aerial photo. But you see a large amount of sediment churned up in this basin, and that sediment is also coming downstream, down that mouth to the breakwater on Lake Erie. A lot of the sediment comes from the surrounding agricultural land. Lake Erie itself is contributing a good deal of material here at the breakwater, the, the mouth of this marina. 
through longshore action and storm events. In this case, the marina takes the material and they have previously been authorized to discharge it downshore of the breakwater as beach nourishment. <clears throat> Many folks are, especially those folks who are attending our presentation today, have probably gone through the process at least once. But just to kind of reiterate the process, you submit one permit application. Both EGLE and the Corps is going to be reviewing that. We may have different information requirements. You will come to, an EGLE will come to a, its permit decision, and the Corps is going to come to its own decision regarding the project based on different statutes. And when you're applying for this permit, it's very important to submit project drawings. We always like to remind folks of some of the really important aspects of project drawings because as soon as we can begin reviewing your project, as soon as we get a complete application from you. So plan view and cross-sectional drawings, all the relevant information is legible and clear, um, not teeny tiny. Scales are a great thing um, and all dimensions on the project drawings. I'm going to look specifically at drawings for dredging projects. Me. So it's always good to review the details. And in this case, our nationwide and regionals require us to identify where you're going to be dredging. So we need to know the dimension of the dredge area in relationship to a fixed structure, if any exists, um, to the shoreline, so that we, we have a good idea. Of, of where this area is going to be and the size of it. We also need you to identify the ordinary high watermark. That's very important. And the toe of the bluff, if it's applicable. Those things are critical to making a decision. And we need to also know what the cross section is going to look like. Again, we're going to be asking for much of the same information, showing existing and proposed conditions if possible, show both the Eagle and the core ordinary high watermark elevations. Toe of the bluff is applicable. And specific datum, if you have the ordinary high watermark, um, what datum you're using. And it's also helpful to get the water level and, um, and the date that you took that water level in your project area. Here's an example of a cross-sectional drawing. You see we have the proposed dredge area. So the existing would be this line here. This is the proposed area. So it's not really that hard um, to do, just cross-hatch that. And we're also looking at the depth you wish to um, dredge and the water level on a certain date. Dredging can also be part of much water projects. So when we talk to you about your proposed activity, we may be asking many questions about your construction sequence. So when you're going to dredge, how will the work be accomplished? Many project details need to be considered in an application and accounted for in the permit process. Some of these questions include how will the dredge material be handled and or disposed of? So handling the dredged material, parts of the slurry line and the outfall pipe that extend into the waterway, the discharge of any hydraulic dredge return water, any placement of fill in adjacent wetlands, if the spoils and the watering area involve placement of dredged material in a wetland or waterward of the ordinary high water mark, it would need a permit as well Although upland alternatives are usually available for dredged material, the watering area. Uh, 
I mentioned that hydraulic dredging has been left the disposal of the dredged material meets certain conditions. In this case that you see here, the applicant prepared two upland sites and construct a berm around the disposal area to contain the material to be dewatered. Meeting the conditions for hydraulic dredging is not as easy as it seems. Most applicants don't have enough land on which to build dewatering areas. A core site visit may be needed to confirm that there are no wetlands in the proposed dewatering area. If it is a temporary dewatering area, <coughs> the area needs the area that the dredged material will eventually be moved to also needs to be upland. So we'll need to verify that as well. If the dewatering area is permanent, if it is in a floodplain, as in this example, the state may have additional requirements. The example on this slide is indeed a rare situation. The applicant owned all the land. He did all the work himself. It took him two years from the time we did the site inspection for wetlands and did the wetland delineation to building these dewatering cells. Areas adjacent to drains may be wetlands, so it helps to have a consultant delineate adjacent wetlands <clears throat> and then have those that delineation verified by both the core and e prior to submitting an application. Discharging material from the drain into adjacent wetlands would require a permit. So for either temporary or permanent placement, in all regulated waterways, yes, in, you will require a permit. In uplands with absolutely no return to the waterway and wetlands, no. So this might Having no return might require having silt fences or other devices in place until that pile of dredged material is vegetated or stabilized. Um, it is not unusual for the Corps to be asking a contractor to pull that material back away from the, a waterway or a wetland. Here are some examples where side casting took place with or without a permit. Uh, um, but please be aware that where you place this dredged material is always going to be a consideration in the review process. Again, here's more emphasis on what are you going to do with the dredged material. We require that all disposal locations be identified. If you're not sure of what might be a good life location, again, let us know so we can come out and verify appropriate locations. Also, don't forget to add dimensions to the proposed disposal locations and <clears throat> so that we, we actually can understand those dimensions. Some people, particularly clients, may not understand what 30 cubic yards being placed directly landward of their seawall is really going to look like, especially if that might need to be uh, repeated in, say, 10 years. So let's take a look at dredging as parts of other projects. Dredging is also often considered part of uh, putting down to tow stone for riprap projects as that's the landward of a seawall to remove structures or temporary fills to say you're building a new dock. Um, you need to account for, is it deep enough there at the new dock for the boat that you plan on parking there? Here are other cases of temporary construction measures that involve dredging. The photo on the left, they're dredging material out of a river mouth on Lake Michigan to build a temporary fill pad to operate from. This dredging and the subsequent discharge of dredged material was not accounted for in their permit application. They did not actually have the equipment large enough to execute the authorized work without this extra measure. 
in the photo on the right, you see they had to build a temporary road to access this bridge abutment to prevent siltation due to the erosion of the temporary fill road. The silt curtain is necessary. Silt curtains are often a requirement for dredging to contain sedimentation, and it's considered a structure in the waterway. So it should be accounted for and shown on plan view and cross-sectional drawings. Here, the area outlined in red shows the proposed 4x4 four four dredge area for King and Toastone in this revetment project. If you look at the chart above, it shows the dimensions of the dredge area and the volume of material to be excavated below the plane of the ordinary high water mark. On the Great Lakes, the core has jurisdiction to the toe of the bluff due to the dynamic nature of the lakes. Any project that may impact the course condition capacity or location of a navigable water may require core review. If you ever have any questions, if you need a permit for actions that you are, projects that you're doing that are, <clears throat> excuse me, landward of the ordinary high water mark, just feel free to give us a call. Here's another pro proposed revetment at the top of the bluff where material is being dredged for the placement of towstone. The drawing, the drawing, the work is not occurring in the waterway <clears throat> directly. However, it is occurring waterward of the ordinary high water mark. Rip rip revetment projects like this are really common, particularly in the last few years of high water on the Great Lakes. This is another great cross section of a proposed dredging with a seawall replacement, riprap, towstone, and a pier. So some of the things you need is what you, how deep do you intend to dredge it for the project? What is the lake level on a certain date? You have a scale. Uh, so these are all important aspects to be included on a, on a cross-sectional drawing. We also like to remind folks that in these modern times, we can submit photos, and photos are worth a thousand words. Again, a lot of our restrictions on nationwide and regional involve the presence or absence of wetlands. Um, so non-wetland, clearly there's nothing, there's no aquatic vegetation here, and on the right, where it's not the ideal picture of the wetland, but you can see these little bulrushes sticking up here. You see all the sphagmites in the back. So this actually has a aquatic bed wetland present here. So I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Um, just pop the question into the chat with Jake. If you don't have any questions at the time, you know, you can always reach us through our web page. You can also contact us directly. We have a map on our web page that shows the different areas where we have offices, field offices, and phone numbers where you can contact us. I'm sorry, Sabrina, I was double, double muted. I didn't realize. Um, we did get a question, and the question is, what is the course jurisdictional limits on Lake Michigan? Oh, checking on my uh, handy chart here by the side of my desk. <clears throat> the ordinary high water mark is um, actually at it's actually different at different locations on Lake Michigan. The ordinary high water mark list for the core ordinary high water marks is available on our web page. <coughs> I'm sorry, folks. I had this throat thing all day. Um, so at different uh, areas, such as Escanaba, it's 581.5. Uh, um, Mackinac City, 581.5. Um, so it's actually... It's that's 581 across the whole board. How about that? Um, but again, as I said, on the different lakes, at different points on the lakes, um, the ordinary high water mark can change. So be aware of that, especially um, going upstream on some of the navigable waterways. You should check our list on our webpage. page. <clears throat> 